Hi everyone, um, welcome to uh, Sustainable Buildings Canada product knowledge uh, webinar. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, QEA Tech's thermographic analysis and Cascadia Windows Cascadia Clip um, thermal uh, bridging clip system. Um, here's a, an agenda of our arrangement today. So we're, we're sort of a, a fast one today, just one hour. Um, um, if I haven't introduced myself already, I think I did. My name is Adam Jones. Um, I am here on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada um, to give us a little bit of uh, uh, context for the, the discussion. And then I'm going to hand it over to Mohit Kant of QEA Tech, um, and he's going to run us through their infrared thermographic scanning process. Um, and then we'll pass it over to Parekh Lally of Cascadia Windows um, to run us through the their product and how it works. Um, one one note here we are ramping up for uh, november 1st 2022 for the green building festival our theme this year is positive um, so the festival programming is going to focus on the challenge and opportunities of achieving and maintaining positive outcomes everyone who is on the call today is in luck because we actually have a special um, online 50% um, off for Earth Day, so um, this you can use the code Earth22 starting tomorrow in 48 hours to use that code to get 50% off online attendance um, to our Green Building Festival for 2022. Um, so that is very exciting. Um, and also we have a, um, our, our, one of our, our main sponsors, um, Enbridge, um, is launching a new program and wanted our uh, attendees today to be among the first to hear about it. So this is an incentive uh, program to help testing, air tightness testing for commercial uh, buildings and multi-unit residential buildings, new for new construction. Um, so there are there are some exceptions, but uh, the financial incentive is 50 cents per square foot, up to $30,000 per project. Um, and you can contact uh, Matthew Marazzo at Enbridge uh, for more information about that program. It is literally just launching now. Uh, we don't even have a website to send you to, so contact Matthew about that. Um, for context today, what, what we've been doing, Sustainable Buildings Canada, over the last little while um, has been redirecting our efforts uh, toward existing buildings. Um, while a bulk of our efforts um, have been focused on new buildings, we realized that it doesn't matter how many new buildings we're building, all of the buildings that we have in Canada uh, and around the world are going to continue to exist, aside from those that um, get uh, knocked down for new buildings, but we have a lot of buildings in the world, um, and 12% of Canada's GHG emissions are directly attributed to buildings, so that's for uh, mostly heating energy. Um, and then there's the uh, generation of electricity for buildings. And one of the things we have been promoting and discussing a lot lately has been the uh, electrification or fuel switching um, for buildings as we try to reduce our reliance on um, the greenhouse gas fossil fuels, um, particularly natural gas, which has been dominating uh, heating um, for the past um, decade or so. Um, so what we are looking at today is part of this larger conversation about how to make buildings more efficient, thermally efficient, so that we don't need as much energy for heating them. So on our website at sbcanada.org slash white papers, you can find a lot of resources uh, about new construction, how to change uh, your, your energy systems for high efficiency buildings. One of the great things about a thermally efficient building is that you do not need as much energy for heating and cooling. Um, we have also now started to add to that collection of resources on the topic of energy efficiency in existing buildings, how to drive down energy demand for buildings. And even um, there's a lot being done with just paying attention to what the energy is being used for, analyzing the energy and using it more efficiently that way. Many people attended our recent um, Deep Energy Retrofit um, webinar for the Thermal Bridging Analysis Guide developed by RDH Building Science on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada. Um, and the, the 
technologies we're seeing today are things that once you start doing an analysis, you might want to contact these uh, companies and find out more about how to use their products to help you with this. Um, particularly, it's difficult for you to understand, and particularly in large buildings, it's difficult to understand how the, the thermal bridges are, are happening, where your energy losses are. Um, and so QEA Tech, um, we're gonna learn about how they can help you identify sources of energy loss in a building, and then how you can um, address those um, using the Cascadia Eclipse um, and good insulation. Before I introduce our presenters, I want to um, do a poll here of our uh, attendees. I have two questions here. Question one here is, there, you should see that on your screen now. Are you planning a building envelope renovation, retrofit, or upgrade, um, and when? So um, if everyone could take a second, answer that. Um, you know, part of our goal with these webinars is to address the questions and concerns that um, you have um, and bring you topics that will help you. Um, and so this, this one is pretty specific. If you're planning a, a building envelope um, upgrade or renovation or retrofit, um, it will be helpful to know. So I'm going to let this one stay open just for a moment, and then we're going to close it. And then I have uh, another question as well. Um, so we have, uh, oops, here. So while we're doing this, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna close this one out. And here we can share the results. So uh, for the people on the call today, uh, about 36%, about a third of people are not planning and then the remainder are uh, sometime soon. So uh, almost a third this year um, and then the remainder coming up soon. So let's do the, I'm gonna do the second one. And then while I do that, I'm going to cover a bit of the uh, mechanics of the webinar as we go forward. So one thing, you should know uh, is that there is a chat function and then there's a raise hand function. Um, so throughout the, the webinar for each section of it, um, feel free to type in questions you have and then we'll read them. Um, I'll read them to the, the presenter afterward. If you would like to um, ask the question directly, uh, but please put that right in the chat and what I'll do is I can open up your microphone and allow you to ask directly. You can also raise your hand and then during the Q&A period for each, what I will do is um, call on people in order um, of their hand raising. Um, so just one more minute with this one. Um, and so the question here is, are you planning a, a building mechanical system uh, replacement or upgrade? Um, the reason I'm asking this is that Often the best time to address a, uh, an envelope um, upgrade is actually when you're replacing the, the uh, mechanical system. If your intent is to replace a mechanical system in a building that has been there 30 years, um, it might be a great time to look at your uh, building envelope. Maybe you need to upgrade the windows uh, or add insulation with an overcladding system. Uh, and then that can allow you to reduce the size of your uh, mechanical system. Um, this is one thing that we at SBC have uh, learned and try to share with everyone as much as we can is that addressing each of these systems individually is not the most efficient, um, it's not the most cost efficient way uh, to address these problems. And it certainly is not going to help in our larger um, sustainability efforts. If you're going to replace a piece of equipment with the cheapest thing right now, um, it doesn't address what your energy um, is going to look like over the next 20 or 30 years. You can lock yourself into a very inefficient, expensive, um, unsustainable technology just because you're looking at isolation. Okay, so here I'm gonna close that one out and then I'll share the results there. Uh, so I can only see it on this other screen. So it looks like 50% are, uh, so half of our attendees are not planning a building mechanical system upgrade and the remainder are uh, sort of mostly in this year or in the next five years. So this is a great time to start looking at how you can um, combine all of these systems together um, to get the most cost efficient and uh, I mean time efficient method of doing this, uh, these retrofits. Okay, well, I have a couple of questions uh, coming in right now. So I'm gonna save these uh, for the Q&A period. Um, 
And I'm going and to introduce our, our, both of our presenters are on screen now. You should be able to see them. Uh, we have Mohit Kant uh, from QEA Tech and Parekh Lally from Cascadia Windows. Um, uh, I would like to thank them off the start both for taking the time to present these technologies to us. Um, it's really, you know, taking the time to explain how these technologies can help us uh, as designers, as uh, regulators, as planners, um, people who are looking at building sustainability and uh, finding ways to solve the actual practical problems of reducing energy demand for buildings. Um, so thank you both. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Mohit right now. And where are we? There we go. So, I don't mind. Mohit, you Adam, I'm just, I'm seeing, I'm still seeing the quick poll. I'm not sure if I'm the only oh, one. You're right. Uh, Thank I you for that. I stopped seeing the quick poll. That was okay. just, I was holding on the results. Thanks for that, Parekh. Okay, no worries. Okay. Sorry, there's something wrong with the screen. <laughs> Slight technical difficulty. It always works perfectly. Uh, uh, in the prep. <laughs> agreed, agreed. <laughs> okay, so where is the share screen? Okay, there you go. There, it looks good. Okay, what do you oh, see? Now we're seeing. Now we're seeing notes mode. Now we're seeing notes mode. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, let me know when you can see my screen now. There, now we see, it looks like your desktop right now. You see a desktop, okay, perfect. There. You can see the presentation? It looks good. All right, over to you, Mohit. Wonderful, Wonderful. okay. It's been, what has been, well, this is year three of the pandemic and uh, this question of, can you see my screen still doesn't get old, eh? Um, all right, everybody, First, a huge thank you to Adam and Mike at Sustainable Buildings Canada for this opportunity to speak to you wonderful people about this new and innovative technology. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, QEA Tech, pronounced Key Tech, uh, is short for Quantifiable Energy Audit. Uh, and we're a startup focused on performing building envelope energy audits using dro uh, drone thermography. My name is Mohit, and I'm the channel manager at Key Tech. I uh, have a background in uh, building energy management, uh, hydronics, and building automation. So for a little bit of context. Onward. So I'm going to try and keep this presentation as short and sweet as possible so we can get the discussion going. Um, we're going to start with our problem statement, uh, go into our solution, see how it works, um, show you some results from a third-party validation study for this technology, and then we're going to jump into some case studies and examples. So let's get into it. So Canadians spend tens of billions of dollars annually on heating and cooling, and up to 42% of this energy is consumed by commercial and institutional buildings. And up to 45% of Canada's VHG emissions are attributed to heating and cooling. Now, much of Canada's built environment that will exist in 2050 has already been built. Um, therefore, any carbon reduction strategy must include building retrofits. But now you may ask, what does this really have to do with the building envelope, right? Can't I just upgrade to the latest and greatest in heat pump technology and make these emissions disappear? The answer is yes, you can, but also no, you can't. Because much of Canada's heating is supplied today by natural gas and many buildings don't even have air conditioning. So moving everything over to heat pumps is simply not viable with today's electrical infrastructure. So if you want to change how these spaces are heated and cooled, we have to reduce the amount of power required to do it. And here's where the building envelope comes in. Because it turns out your building envelope is the single largest factor in determining building loads. Therefore, you can dramatically reduce HVAC demand and energy consumption by upgrading it. Right. Uh, one estimate says up to 80% energy savings are uh, available 
uh, from improving the building envelope, but we have seen there have been instances where the opportunity is even larger. So what's the holdup, right? Does this not make does this not make sense? Well, in theory, it makes sense. But unfortunately, there has been a lack of non-invasive audit technology for building envelopes. Uh, for example, until now, to actually measure the U value of any part of the building envelope, either you have to do these in-suite measurements or you got to actually take a core sample of the build of a part of the building. And not everyone's too thrilled about, you know, taking a core example out of the building envelope. Um, so for the most part today, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, there's a high reliance on energy models and roundabout methods to calculate building envelope performance. Understandably, these models are shaky and it's hard to rely purely on them to help inform a, a true return on investment on any upgrades that one might do. And that makes these investments into your building envelope high risk. It also doesn't help that these upgrades are often expensive with a capital E, and that just makes a dire situation worse. So what does this mean for the built environment? Well, often building envelopes are only upgraded when they're failing, and these upgrades are seen as a necessary evil as opposed to an energy and greenhouse gas reduction strategy. So here's where we come in. We offer a unique audit to deliver a clear data-driven assessment of your building envelope. This includes measuring your thermal transmittances or U values of each element of the building envelope, like your windows, doors, walls, roof, all of it, and analyzing the heat losses and gains through them. So we'll be able to tell you, you know, you're losing 100 megawatt hours through the eastern uh, facade walls uh, annually, uh, just in heating, and maybe two megawatt hours on cooling, for example, right? This information can then be used to prioritize repairs and upgrades, forming a roadmap of sorts. And this helps minimize capital risk and maximize return on investment. So you'll, you'll essentially be able to prioritize what repairs or what upgrades need to be done first, right? The Western facade uh, windows on the third floor, they're all in bad shape. Let's replace those first. Start saving money and apply those savings over to the next uh, project. Additionally, performing these audits regularly helps monitor the building envelope for anomalies and deterioration, and also minimizes the risk for emergency repairs. And emergency repairs, anybody in facilities management can tell you, they cost a hell of a lot more than planned repairs. So now let's get into the meat of it. Here's how the audit works. We start by flying a drone around the facility in a pre-planned flight path and capturing hundreds to sometimes thousands of images. These images are then validated and processed to prepare them for analysis. And our proprietary software is then used to analyze each image at a pixel level to identify issues, quantify their effects on the energy use of the building, and then group each area of interest based on measured performance, right? So, uh, for example, we have a three-tiered system that tells you if uh, a section of the roof should, uh, you know, it's in good shape, it should be maintained, it's shaky, but things aren't so bad yet, so it should be monitored, or, you know, the situation looks pretty bad, there seems to be some sort of large thermal leak, so this area should be investigated. The final report includes three parts. First, you receive a qualitative report uh, discussing each problem area within the envelope, such as, for example, thermal bridging on the fourth floor of the eastern facade or, for, or failing IGUs on the northern facade, et cetera. A quantitative report quantifying the U values of each building element, along with their associated annual heat loss and gain estimations. And that's something we tell you. We tell you this is what the heat loss is. This is what the heat gain is, uh, depending on uh, the depending on the time of year. And finally, you gain access to our portal, which includes a measurable 3D model of the building, along with overlays of the report on this model. A short glimpse into this portal is, uh, will be shown in the next slide. So this is just a little video embedded in. Uh, you guys should be able to see it. Uh, this is a building that we scanned uh, last December. 
uh, you can see there's some yellow and peach boxes. Uh, the, the color coding is based on the scaling system that I mentioned earlier of uh, monitor and investigate. Um, this is the measurable model. It's built off of many, many high res images, all of which are also individually accessible through this uh, through this portal. As you can see, uh, there's the measurement uh, part and it's pretty accurate. This is just a little glimpse into our software suite. Uh, so while these applications form the backbone of our analysis, we recently moved everything over to the cloud and integrated all these applications to allow for greater flexibility and speed on the analysis. So uh, one example was where it took about 30 minutes earlier to generate a full-fledged report. That, can now, that now takes under 30 seconds. Another important part of the software is the use of automated fault finding. As we continue to do more projects, the analyze information is continuously training a backend algorithm to recognize building elements and common issues that occur within them, right? So as time goes on, this is increasing the speed of our analysis and the accuracy and automating more and more of it. So the more projects we do, the better this algorithm gets and the faster the next project becomes and the more accurate the savings and the more accurate the, the issue finding becomes as time goes on. Now, the technology is all well and good, but how do you know, how do you, the consumer, know that it actually works? Well, we've tested it uh, ourselves against in situ U value measurement kits and found ourselves to be within a couple, a couple of percentage points of those measurements. Um, and we've also gone forward and uh, had a third party come in to do their own validation study. So the researcher, uh, these researchers from the University of Ottawa conducted a study to compare our U-value measurements against both a theoretical calculation, uh, which is which was made through a, a model, as well as against finite element modeling. The results showed that the theoretical calculation was off by a large margin, as you can see, it was uh, it came up to 0.79 uh, watts per meter square kelvin, um, and the finite element uh, analysis and our methodology agreed quite well where your where the third met method provided 1.29 and our uh, our methodology led us to uh, 1.3 now when our measured u values were inputted into the energy plus model the predicted energy usage was within two percent of the actual energy usage of the building and this proved the accuracy of our analysis uh, this study is going to be published next month and uh, will be available uh, for the broader public. Now, let's jump into some case studies. This is a large healthcare facility that we audited last year, and we found that up to 58% of the energy lost through the building envelope could be prevented by upgrading uh, the envelope up to the 2017 building code. Um, of course, in reality, it may or may not be possible. Uh, you know, maybe you could go further, maybe you can't even get to this level. But the key idea there, uh, going through the report, is you can find you can find areas of uh, doing targeted retrofits as opposed to going for a whole uh, full-fledged deep retrofit. But if you do want to go for a full-fledged deep retrofit, this report can help you just as well. Um, from our findings, we found that the preventable energy loss was about 4,200 megawatt hours per year, uh, which equated to about uh, over half a million dollars in energy savings. And uh, you could prevent up to 718 tons of CO2 equivalent from being emitted into the atmosphere. Once again, from building this, uh, bring the building up over to the 2017 building code. Uh, if you were to uh, bring this building up uh, over to the net zero code, the savings would obviously be much higher. Next, we have uh, a large uh, multi-res complex. Uh, this was an interesting one because it was undergoing retrofits uh, to replace failing windows at the time of the scan. So it allowed us to measure the new values of the old as well as new windows side by side and measure the, uh, measure the contrast and performance. And as you can see from the image uh, right, right here, uh, the newer window uh, in the infrared scan looks pretty much like a wall. It looks pretty much like the wall beside it, whereas the older window is lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, 
in this case, what we found was that the older windows had a U value of 3.64 and post retrofit, the newer windows, which are high grade, had a U value of 1.5, uh, effective U value of 1.58. Uh, for reference, the National Building Code currently specifies a U-value of 2.56. So uh, this is the last uh, case study. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this building is packed with IGUs, as you can see. And uh, we could actually see the windows that were losing argon gas. And, were, and we were able to quantify the associated thermal effects. I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide, where I get into examples of, some, of what some of the issues look like. Um, so as you can see, these IGUs have, have lost, lost a lot more argon lot gas more than the other ones, other right? Ones, um, right? And, uh, this IGU right here is starting to lose argon gas. Um, and we also took some images uh, a couple of years later to see how much more uh, these IGUs had deteriorated, right? And you can actually see where uh, in the older images, some of the areas which had a loss, argon gas, or had very little loss, had much larger loss two years down the line. Another common issue we see is that of ice, uh, ice accumulation. Um, as you can, you can't really see it on the visual image, right? It looks, it looks like a standard building, but in the the IR image reveals moisture that got trapped behind the wall and froze. And um, on a side note, you can also see some thermal bridging on this image. So these scans also help find cracks and leaks not visible to the naked eye. Um, as you can see, this wall looks absolutely fine in broad daylight, but under the eye of uh, the infrared camera, you can see a crack right here. Um, a thermal image was taken after it had rained, and you can see uh, the you can see the path of moisture is taking on this wall and where it's accumulating. It's really interesting. Finally, I mean, the use cases of this technology are innumerable. Uh, so far, I've spoken about the building envelope, but there's applications on the solar side, power lines, and whatnot as well. But coming back to buildings, in my opinion, every single building in the world can use this service, right? The performance of old buildings can be measured, and the energy effects of any retrofits or upgrades can be verified. Uh, new buildings can use this technology for commissioning and to verify that the building has been built to design. There's never been a way to achieve this level of granularity in analysis in this short time period until now. So please get in touch with us if you'd like to learn more. And that is a presentation. So let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Mohit. Um... That, that was really fascinating, um, particularly, I mean, I, I, I was shocked by the uh, the water damage and then the ice, the ice stuck inside the building. Um, yep. You know, obviously that happens, but it's uh, hard to recognize it. So that's uh, wonderful, <laughs> this, a way that you can find it. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to ask some that were put in there. Um, does the analysis need to be done at a specific time of day, of year? Uh, like, are there restrictions on when it needs to be? So uh, there, uh, there is a time restriction on when we can conduct the thermal scans. Um, essentially, what we need is we need a 10 degree delta, uh, 10 degree Celsius delta between the inside and the outside uh, of the building. So typically, that that in Canada that leads us to um, anywhere from September to May. Uh, summer months are off limits, unfortunately, both due to solar loading as well as higher average temperatures. Um, if you look at more warmer climates, so for example, if you look at Arizona, the, uh, the your time period is flipped because Arizona has a much warmer climate, so your delta T's would just be on the other side, right? If it's 40 degrees Celsius there, that's good for us because you're trying to maintain 20, 22 degrees Celsius on the inside. Okay. So as we, some of us suspected, uh, needed to be done in the cold months. Okay, um, we have a, a question here, Bob Marshall. I am going to open up your microphone there. So now you are free. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, and then mm -hmm. uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me now? Yes. There. Now we can hear you. Oh. <laughs> I'm challenged. I was going to put the. I was trying to put the message in. Uh, 
great, great presentation, uh, Moet. Uh, I done a lot of audits, and you know, of course, the windows come out, and the first thing the board does is, you know, there's no way they're going to spend that kind of money. They'd rather paint the hallways and you know make it all pretty. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, so I wondered your success rate. How? How many of uh, from the uh, audits um, result in an actual retrofit? Um, just you know, roughly speaking, I just wondering what the uptake is. Uh, whether some whether incentives might help, but um, it's frustrating because you know you know the buildings are sieves, um, but the condo boards sorry not the condo boards necessarily, but typically it's the the condo board want to keep everything down to the lowest possible uh, reserve and uh, and uh, operating cost. So it, thing is, it really depends, right? Uh, there are certain uh, there's certain building owners and certain property management companies that are more focused on reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions that have more stringent sustainability targets and they are often uh, more susceptible to making the change to making the upgrades right um, often what what i found is companies and people who are going in for the audit are already motivated to make changes right they're as opposed to them looking at the audit as you know tell us if there is something wrong they're looking for tell us where there is something wrong so we can fix it right so they're already going in with the mindset of yeah we have to go in and do and make some of these projects happen we just need to know like what route do we take so the short answer is the uptake has actually been quite high in terms of upgrades. Uh, and we're getting into uh, like a lot of those upgrades are actually happening now and will be happening this summer. And then we're going to be going back to do verification scans for a lot of these uh, customers. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Bob. Um, all right. Another question that was uh, put in there. Um, the model that you have at the, uh, that you, the customers receive. Um, is this a model that is compatible with uh, BIM? Um, so could they take the model from you and then import that into their own existing? Um, so it, I think it is. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we, uh, for the 3D model, we use Pix4D on the back end. I believe they do have, uh, I believe they do have uh, some functionality where you can uh, transport this over to BIM. But uh, once again, I'm not 100% sure. That's something I can definitely look at and get back to you. So uh, my email is on the screen. Shoot me the email, and uh, I'll make sure I'll get back to you right away. Thanks. Uh, OK, I'm just looking at the time. I think we have time for maybe one or two short ones here. I'm going to try to um, uh, here we go. Oh, the case studies. Um, it, are, are we, do we have access to the case studies? Because um, some, some people would like to look a little deeper into those uh yes so again once again reach out to me uh shoot me an email i'll uh, email the case studies over to you okay maybe that maybe that's something that uh i can get from you and then i can share with everyone who's on the uh, absolutely call today. Uh, I can perfect the um and then the oh so just kind of a an algorithm, uh, the analysis algorithm. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that it's it's sort of taking the data that you're collecting and then um, making it smart. Can you expand on that a little bit? So the the algorithm is that's what is proprietary, right? We're essentially taking the temperature data that we're getting from uh, these images, and we are processing it and contextualizing it with other information of the building. I can't get too deep into uh, into what the algorithm is because like I said, it is proprietary, but uh, in a nutshell, that is what is happening, right? We're using the temperature data that we're getting from the images, contextualizing it with a whole host of other data that we're collecting on site, as well as getting from the property manager, contextualizing it with the utility data, and that's how we're able to then convert that to a U value and an energy loss number. Okay, understood. Um, all right, so it's it's uh, expanding the the usefulness of the data um, for your your exactly. clients. Exactly. Okay, great. 
Um, all right. Uh, well, we're going to have to move on now. And um, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, feel free to type them in, and uh, we'll try to squeeze them in at the end. Or feel free to email Mohit at any time. There's his contact info on the screen. Um, thank you again. We are going to head over to Parake now. Um, here we go. So okay, there, Parake. And okay, I'm unmuted. Um, yep, we can hear you now. So okay, just a second here. Can you uh, see the screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, perfect. There. We're in full screen. All right, uh, over to you. Great. Okay. Th thanks, Adam, and thank you, uh, Mohit. Brilliant, uh, interesting presentation. So, my name is Parik Lali. Um, uh, I represent Cascadia. Um, Cascadia's got windows and doors, but um, the picture you're seeing, <coughs> excuse me, in front of you um, is a. I think actually it's it's similar to a retrofit building that. Uh, Cascadia was involved in a few years ago called the Belmont. And if anybody wants to see a, an interesting case history with RDH Engineering, who obviously I'm sure you're familiar with, and this Belmont project, you can look it up. Uh, it resulted in a 90% reduction uh, in, in energy use through upgrading the walls and, and the windows. Um, briefly on Cascadia, is uh, it's a company that was formed actually in 2008-2009 by building scientists, in fact, to solve some problems that were they knew were going to be inherent as ASHRAE and building codes took hold, you know, over 12, 13 years ago. And they identified two areas that need to be dealt with or, or solved issues. And one was, um, you know, with walls, how to reduce thermal bridging and with windows, how to have, you know, high performance windows, because without you know, you can have lots of insulation and a great air barrier, but if you don't solve thermal bridging and if you don't solve the fenestration issues, you've still got a big problem. So fiberglass was chosen as the base material for both the thermal spacers and the window frames because it's very durable, uh, it's very strong, it's low conductivity. So it meets sort of all the characteristics. And Cascadia just on the window side has passive house windows, but really focused on the institutional commercial sort of high rise side, they're very high performance. And Cascadia also has the first sort of fiberglass window wall, again, with R values up to R7, so very high performance. But here I'm going to focus again on the Cascadia clips. Um, and just to illustrate how important cladding attachment is, uh, is, a, is a, this is a comparative for two, pro uh, two projects. One was uh, approximately 2011. It was like a lead platinum building on the west coast where the architect was trying to achieve a very high thermal performance. And in order to do so with the technology that was available then, use 12 inches of mineral wool uh, with crossing Z girts to meet the energy requirements. Now, a few years later, uh, with the advent of thermal spacers and the Cascadia clip in particular, you can see here these orange clips with a vertical one inch rail on the outside. So inside it's completely continuous insulation except for the little clip portion. Three and a half inches of insulation would meet the same performance and in fact slightly better than 12 inches on the other projects. So that's how much you know, the attachment system matters. Um, again, you know all of this about you know what conduction is and conductivity is the rate of heat flow uh, on materials and of course conductance is the U value which is the metric we use. The the thing I just want to point to, point out to are the numbers below which is the conductivity of various building materials and I, I'll, I'll enlarge it on a slide here. This is important because obviously you know highly conductive materials like aluminum or steel or stainless steel represent thermal leaks if they're continuous through the envelope. So you can see that aluminum steel and stainless steel are, as I say, highly conductive, approximately 100 to 1,000 times as conductive as fiberglass or wood materials, which in turn obviously are quite a bit more conductive than, than insulation, which is designed to be low conductivity. So the really key point is from a physics standpoint is we want to eliminate, um, uh, excuse me, we want to eliminate the use of highly conductivity, conductive materials like steel Z-girts, like 
um, like shelf angles, continuous shelf angles, aluminum window frames, all of those things are challenges. Um, just to give you a little bit of a comparative, you know, the solutions, the old solution of a, a Ziegert was, was very good structurally and very good from a, a fire performance standpoint, but very, very poor thermally. Losses 40 to 70%, which are unacceptable in today's world. And then you've got, you know, cladding attachment systems, which, which use sort of are primarily metal with the used pads, you know, and you can see a couple of examples of those there where the pads at the back are designed to reduce the heat flow. And then of course, you've got products like the Cascadia clip, which is fiber glass itself. So it, the, the, the cladding attachment itself is the, it's, oops, uh, excuse me a second. Sorry, can you see my screen? Uh, we okay. are just seeing the, the slideshow still. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, no, there was a, I, I hit the wrong button. On the right, you see, the, so the, the clip itself is the cladding attachment, or is the thermal, uh, um, is the thermal brick. It's not relying on a pad. And, and again, a point just to note, like, because people often think thermal brakes are like on-off switches. They're not. They just reduce heat flow. So it's the more efficient systems reduce more, the less efficient systems reduce less, but nothing is 100% perfect. This is an example of what it looks like on a wall. So you see these spacers here, they're color coded. This is a six inch clip or 150 millimeters with uh, six inches of mineral wool insulation. All, uh, obviously all the insulation here is on the outside, which is obviously very typical in, in Canada and more, becoming more typical elsewhere because it's much more efficient and a safer way to design a building from a condensation standpoint. So you see the thermal spacers here, the clips are about you know two or three feet spaced apart. Um, as we've done our analysis, now we find you can space these out more. But the, the, so the clips are, are spaced out, the continuous metal, and then you've got the uh, cladding attached to that. So that's how the, basically the system works. Um, in terms of the different levels of, of performance, as I've said before, clips are meant to, do, meant to serve a thermal efficiency purpose. So thermal efficiency is their primary goal, but they also have to deal with structural performance because it's carrying a cladding and there are live, live loads and wind loads. Also has to deal with fire performance. So this is an illustration of how the clip is designed. It's designed with a double leg and you can see this fastener goes right between these two legs. So this long fastener connects the Z girth or Z girth at the front, okay, through the clip into the backup wall. And it's designed like that uh, the, so, so that you get a continuous non-combustible connection. You have the steel to steel to steel connection. So that fastener or these fasteners, two per clip, are designed to carry the dead load of the cladding. And as I said, that gives you the non-combustible connection. The fiberglass material acts basically like a, a large, heavy shim, okay, which is low conductivity. So it's a low conductivity system with a continuous uh, non-combustible connection. And because of that, it meets the requirements for a minor combustible component when you're applying uh, the, the, the building and the fire codes to these systems. Um, I just want to make uh, an application here. So you're, we're looking at SB10. You know, this could be many charts that look like this, where you've got, you know, the the, the performance, prescriptive performance requirements for different types of buildings, and obviously for different opaque elements. So I'm zoning in here on a section of that, which is uh, Zone Six. So we're talking about Toronto, where you're talking about like. For example, steel framed walls, the U value requirement is 0 0.044. The R value requirement, which we probably won't do, is R13 in the stud and R15 continuous on the outside. But this is typically where we go. How, how do we determine the U value of any particular wall? That's, that's what I wanted to talk about here. Cascadia has on its website, and there are other tools like this, uh, a calculator. Uh, so I'm going to flip into this calculator uh, now. I'm going to go to the cascadiawindows.com uh, website. 
and then I go into Cascadia Clip. You can see the picture below that I showed you. And so as we connect into the into the clip portion, there you scroll down below the picture, it's a spacing calculator. This is a very useful tool. Um, if you want to know, it's fairly intuitive to use it, but there's a little video on how to use it on the site about five uh, minutes long. Um, it was designed by RDH Engineering using about 75,000 combinations of wall assemblies. And basically, as I say, it's really simple to use. It's a, it's a series of drop-down menus where you describe the structure you're analyzing. As an example, What's the backup walls? Is it, is it steel stud? Is it CMU? Is it concrete or wood stud? And I'll just pick steel studs here for the moment. Next decision is, is the cavity, within, has it got insulation or not? And I'll choose no for the moment. Then you choose the insulation type. Our typical default is R4.3 representing mineral wall. You can go to higher R values with like spray foams, although they're shifting and getting lower now. But so I typically go with R 4.3 mineral wool as the base case. Then you get to choose your fasteners. Um, I covered it very quickly, but you, if you might have noticed that stainless steel is not, not only more durable than galvanized, but it's also lower conductivity. So we will sometimes choose stainless fasteners uh, to get better thermal performance. Although these days with the state of the world, getting stainless anything is a challenge. So I stick with galvanized right now. The, we, we do have very high performance fasteners. They're, they have a coating that's good for 3000 salt spray hours. So it's out of our system are designed for marine climates in terms of durability. Then you go to uh, the spacing. So Horizontal spacing. If you're if you're trying to track on steel studs, you'll be typically at 16 inch on centers with your clips with the clips. If you have a masonry or a brick backup wall, you could go to 24 inch. Um, if we can also even go to 32 inch spacings, and typically that's if our if our metal furring that's outside of the clip is horizontal rather than vertical. But for now, this is just a demo. We we'll go with 16 inch centers. Then we choose a cladding dead load. I typically will choose like five PSF because it covers like fiber cement, ACM, metal panels. It covers a multitude of claddings. Our system though can, can, can uh, analyze up to 20 pounds per square foot. And, and we can go to 30, but beyond 20, we will do the analysis offline, uh, but you can do it online up to 20 PSF, which is effectively like you know, lightweight stone claddings, even you know, an inch and a half thick potentially. But let's go with five PSF. Then we've got, I'm going to choose because we're in Toronto, I'm going to pick five inches of insulation as a baseline. Okay, uh, exterior insulation. So that's five inches of mineral wool uh, on, on the exterior of the wall. So now if we, if we look at this, you, you can then get your performance in a snapshot. It's a R value effective 18.6. U value 0 0.054, which of course is the inverse of the R. And the maximum allowable wind load, this is the structural side, is 138 PSF, which is way more than we need. In other words, normally buildings you know, are 25 to 35 PSF. As you get into mid high rise, you can get up to 60. So 138 is, this is an over design. You have options here to space out the clips. So uh, right now it's the defaults at 26 inches vertically. I'm going to change that to 48 inches vertically. That does two things. It gives you a bump in the thermal performance. It's now 21.2 because you have less connections. And it reduces the allowable wind load to 65.7, which is still plenty. So there's plenty of capacity in the system. So the, the, the advantage with a tool like this is this is value engineering as it should be. In, our, in other words, how do you get equal or better performance and lower the cost? So the, the optimization of clips, spacing them out properly, lowers the cost, but it also increases performance. Um, that's the basic snapshot of the, of the, the calculator. This is you know, the, the, the details behind it for different thicknesses of walls of our insulation is down here. So you can have a look at this at any point in time if you're trying to hit a particular performance requirement. Um, <clears throat> a 
Okay. Uh, sorry, just give me one second here. Yeah, so you can hit a, hit a particular performance requirement. Um, our structural requirements. So I'm available anyway after this, if at any point, or the video will take you through this. But this is an interesting and useful tool, as I say, for analysis and can be done very, very quickly. Um, just to give you a sense here, our galvanized fastener gives you an R value performance of 21.2. If you change that to stainless, it gives you about 23. So it's a, it's a little bit of a bump uh, in performance if you need to get that slight bump while keeping the wall at the same thickness that it was. Okay, so I'm going to um, get out of this and I'm gonna pop back into the presentation again. Okay. So in terms of the system, there are also different options for adjustability. We, we typically try to adjust our, 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 the clips and the thickness of the wall all on the outside with brackets and with shims. So there are a number of different options to adjust the system if the backup wall is uneven. Um, we're doing a lot of sort of high performance projects, as I say, um, this is, a, this is a construction of a fire hall, I think the first passive house fire hall, um, probably in North America. And this is, uh, this is a project in, in British Columbia, um, excuse me, where we're using um, eight inches of exterior insulation. You can see these eight inch thermal spacers with a one inch Z-girt and eight inches of mineral wall uh, ex exterior to obviously uh, an, air, an air vapor barrier membrane. Um, we did a project a couple of years ago called Party and Landing in um, Hamilton. Again, it was an, uh, this was a, an inner fit project, Passive House Retrofit. This one actually used spray foam insulation. Um, and I talked to the architect afterwards uh, about that. You know, obviously spray foam is another possibility. That's a decision you'll have to make depending on, 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 on your preferences. But in talking to the architect afterwards on this project, I said to, to her, she could have actually ended up spacing the clips out more. So that was a, a notion she could take for the next project. They, they're using horizontal uh, rails. So I, I recommended to her to go every second stud and she'll still meet her structural requirements, get a lower cost and better performance. So that's why the calculator is so useful. Um, this is a project, and again, another passive house project done in Massachusetts. And this one is called Finch Cambridge, and it used effectively a split insulation system because it was wood frame construction. So there was four inches of mineral wool on the outside, and then the studs on the inside filled with insulation. Um, you can see here again, this is the, 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 the color coding on the clips. Um, Prince George, this was an Okanagan project called Skeena House, which is just fairly recently being constructed. Again, it's another passive house project, a student housing project. Um, uh, in, 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 in Prince George. This one again used eight inches of exterior insulation um, with, with uh, combinations of horizontal um, carriers and vertical carriers. So the system, uh, as I say, can accommodate a vertical or a horizontal subfurring depending on the cladding type. Okay, so um, I'm sorry to sort of whiz through things there, but that takes me to kind of to the to the end of the presentation. Is there any any questions? Thanks, Park. Um, that that was great. Um, also, it, I see you've turned off your camera for part of it. If you want to turn your camera back on, feel free. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, fine. We had so there are a couple of questions, and then we have uh, a couple. Um, uh, who are ready to uh, jump in here and ask themselves. Um, yeah. One was about, uh, so the spacing requirements, some of the questions you answered as soon as they were asked. Um, are there any challenges related to um, installing at height? So for, um, you know, overcladding on uh, very tall buildings, um, what are the challenges that you've seen with that type of installation? Um, Again, with the, with its with the spacers, if they're going on a vertical, you can actually clip. You know, the clips fit into the steel, so you can take a ten foot piece of steel and pop two or three clips into it and do it that way. But, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, there there are 
the, the, the challenges are obviously it's typically a two-man job okay to do this i mean if the systems are lightweight it's just you probably need two people to, to do it so um the belmont project i referenced i think was about 10 stories so i wouldn't call that a huge high rise but again nothing unusual but but it's 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 just where whereas fiber or metal girts are you know are, are one piece system or more like a one piece system most of the cladding attachment systems have more components so a little more complex okay thanks uh, and then one one other question was sort of the opposite question was uh, are are these uh, appropriate for residential um, retrofits yeah we 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 do a number of them you know we 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 don't do a huge amount but there are our residential retrofits sometimes if it's really thin amounts of yeah thin amounts of insulation people might go with a, a rigid mineral wall you know for a couple of inches of insulation on the exterior but yeah we've done a, a bunch of residential retrofit projects yeah so there's no problem there okay great um all right so we have a couple of questions here that uh, we would like to ask directly if we can so um, first, I'm going to call on uh, David. Uh, there, David Katz. I've unmuted your microphone. If you'd like to ask uh, directly, you can unmute yourself. Um, while we wait there, uh, you should have a request there, David, and if not, I, I will move on. We have another question there, if it's being recorded. Yes, uh, Valentin, uh, the uh, webinar is being recorded and we'll send out a link. Uh, you'll get that uh, probably tomorrow. Usually we just have it set automatically to go 24 hours. Um, all right, uh, David, let me know by chat if you're there uh, and you wanna ask your question again. Uh, Francisco. I'm going to open up your mic there if you would like to ask directly. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Just a simple question about the tool that you were showing. Um, it says full wall effective thermal performance, but just to clarify that that's just the clear field assembly performance, right? Yes, it's the it's yeah, it's just a clear field assembly performance with yeah, with your with your typical spacings for all compo for all components in the wall. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and that was a point I sort of didn't expand on, but but when you you know you when you talk about U values and psi values and chi values, so if we're talking about linear or point loading, you know that is a, a bit of an advantage of a fiberglass spacer because its point loading characteristics will be lower because it's made from fiberglass. So where you've got concentrations, you know, around windows or doors, etc., that's where a a slightly higher performance spacer will make a difference over one maybe say that's metal with a pad. Um, so so yeah, to to, the, to that point, there, it, there's there's deeper analysis as you well know, uh, but this is a very that's a good base tool to start with. Indeed, uh, yeah, it's certainly a, a great place to start. Um, uh, answered a huge number of questions um, right off the bat. The bat, you can just go in there and sort of uh, test out the various things. Um, and then, yeah. is, is there a weight limit? I mean, you said over what was it? Over uh, thirty pounds per square foot. Yeah. You just uh, custom. Yeah, uh, tw the calculator does up to twenty. Uh, we have done projects up to thirty which are rare, uh, we would not be able to do brick, for example, bricks like 40, that would need a, a you know another self-supporting system. But we can do quite heavyweight systems. We, and we like to talk to people about that because if you're talking about things like terracotta, they get a bit, uh, they're unusual because terracottas tend to be point loaded systems. Uh, and we get into that, like it's not uniform loading because they're all carried on proprietary rails. But by and large, they're very small percentage, but we can they can be done. Yeah. Great. Uh, and am I right in if, if I saw this correctly when you were showing um, uh, Cascadia does provide um, uh, detailed drawings, um, same sort of example details for people? Yeah, yeah, we have a bunch of standard details on our website, you know, yeah, in in obviously PDF and CAD, et cetera. So yeah, all that's available. Yeah. Right. Great. 
Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, we're just about out of time. So I wonder uh, if Mohit is still there, if you could uh, come back uh, on camera. Um, Hello. So we had the, hey, there you are. Welcome <laughs> back. So we had this one question um, from David, uh, and I'm just going to read out what he wrote in. Um, and it sort of addresses part of the, I think part of the challenge of why this both of your companies' technologies work so well together is that you're able to um, identify the problems uh, with a building, the, the where those thermal losses are happening, and then uh, address them uh, by overcladding with the, the, the clip system. Um, so David's asking, how do we get recognition that existing windows and doors can be improved by a number of measures rather than replacing them with a new fenestration that has new embodied energy? And this is something that you know, the three of us were just discussing offline that, you know, while these technologies are great for new buildings, there, there are a lot of things that we need to do to drive down embodied energy overall. And I wondered if either of you had any um, you know, comment on, on that notion. Um, well, yeah, actually, it's interesting. I, I mentioned to Adam, I'm a member of a sort of a loose group of people with different sort of technologies, emerging technologies. And one of them was interesting, and I can make a connection maybe. It, 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 it's, it's, a ret, it's not a retrofit of a window, but it's, it's installing essentially a radiant barrier on the inside uh, in a frame inside the window, which serves to create a dead airspace and also reflect heat back into the building while still giving about 90% visibility. It's an interesting product. Um, it was developed in Canada, but I think it's, I, I look at it like something as time has come. It's not, it's not something I do, although I've talked to the guy. So I could, you know, it's a point we could talk about that or I can try to make connections with some information because it would certainly be, hopefully fill that gap between like the whole retrofit idea and, and try, you know, the, the claim of the person who's saying it is we can we can take an existing window and make it into an R6 to 8 window, you know, by, by this technology, which to me is like, <laughs> that's huge, you know, but if, I can make a connection, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, and like we absolutely need more and more technologies like these because uh, from, what, from what I've seen, you building envelope uh, projects are typically super expensive when you start getting into replacement, right? That's one side. And even if even if customers are, or even if uh, you know building owners and managers are able to get over the hump of that initial sticker shock, then you have the other side of you know is is this sort of a large replacement project? Is that really something that's good for the environment? Because sure, I might be able to lower my operating uh, energy use. Right, but then comes the other side that no, you are still uh, installing a whole bunch of new material that a lot of energy went into making. So these in-between solutions, as, as I like to call them, I think I think they are the right way to go. Uh, and more and more technologies like these are needed. And uh, like Parekh said, like that's that sort of a solution. Are cut, like I I know for a fact my customers would just eat it up. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to facilitate something like that one sometime because what would be fantastic for me and the, this person I'm talking to is to 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 see from the experts who are seeing buildings every day is this something that would fly is this something that would have real interest because it's not replacing a window so there you know people like you say they want things to look good always it'll still give you most of that but not everything but it'll give you a lot of what you really want but yeah. But, it's an open question, right? You know, as to what we, <laughs> what we should be doing and what we are doing. Absolutely. Oh, I see, David. I see your um, your hand is up, are, and it looks like you're unmuted. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. My question is, uh, and one, we're working with QEA already, who are doing uh, drones. We've made joint presentations on your drone because your drone shows where the leakage is. And, yeah. and to go to your your comment, uh, Barrett, uh, we're not trying to get new windows not improved. Many of the buildings need new windows. I've just on with the ESCOs, you know, joint webinars going on on duct sealant and energy saving. And then mm -hmm. we make all these improvements and it goes out the building envelope. So yeah. I was introduced to magnetite. I, I sold wind tight. I put plastic on my windows from Canadian Tire, you know, with two-way tape. I think we have to improve the building envelope if we're going to start going to heat pumps. And I'd be yeah. happy to share with you the study I did 
as to what it, the embodied energy of a new window versus uh, a, an acrylic replacement, uh, because as you pointed out, the embodied energy and aluminum and all those other bad things that are cheap, right? So I look forward to presenting it to both of you. And, and maybe uh, to Sustainable Buildings Canada, I had a webinar mm -hmm. on uh, how to improve your existing fenestration at the building show. And it's not only about interior, there are re re reflector shades, automated yeah. shade. We, we, we have so many things we can do with building automation as well that will yeah. save the energy we waste. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, awesome, I'd love to make the connection, yeah. So, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, so that would might be a thing that you could, if, if you send it to all three of us, you have our contact info, um, we, I could share it with the, the rest of the attendees. And, and then, uh -huh. yeah, we, would, uh, we can discuss a, a future webinar partnership. Let me just, if I could only finish, you know, we were about, when we saw that the Green On Fund came out with new windows, and, and you know, we were thrilled, like people should improve their windows and get $500 a window. But Magnetite, who was my client said, wait, David, I could do that for like $100 if the existing window is structurally sound. And so we had to present it to the IESO and we literally got approved by the Green On Fund just before it was canceled because many of the heritage buildings do not want you to even consider replacing the existing window. Uh, right. they, they sold it to Honeywell who did an, an old building for Memorial University because they said, you know, other than caulking around the window, we're, we're subject to the loss of, of heat through these old hundred year old windows. Yep. So I think there's a lot we have to do and I'd be happy to present it to SBC. All right, we will set that up, thanks. Um, all right, well, you know, there's one last question I think that uh, Parekh, you could answer in uh, one minute. Is the clip system appropriate for use with spray foam application on foundation walls below grade? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's appropriate. It's just that, uh, you know, you'd have to protect the spray foam, I would assume, and, and the system with, with some kind of an exterior grade uh, sheathing to prevent moisture, you know, getting into the system. There's nothing, the clip itself is fine. It's fiberglass. The fasteners are, and the, and the steel are all pretty high durability finishes. So yeah, it can be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no okay. reason not to, yeah. Great, that's actually a great question because it is a, a particular challenge. Um, I think with res residential um, overcladding um, retrofits um, where, you know, uh, per, I, I know I'm spending a lot of time trying to find solutions other than foam. Um, to avoid the environmental impact of using foam. Um, and so, yeah, that, that might be a great solution. Uh, thanks for that question. That was uh, from uh, Zygmunt. Um, okay. Yeah. And foam Foam's getting better, right? Like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know the total analysis is being done, but it's, you know, they, 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 it's now HFO requirements, right, in Canada. So, but I mean, I know there's tons of different points of discussion there. And I have a background in mineral wool, so I'm just <laughs> putting it out there. So, absolutely. Well, I, that we are already over time by about eight minutes. So, uh, we could continue all day, but we'll have to cut it short here. I would like to thank you both uh, for taking the time um, and presenting us these technologies and this conversation. And hopefully, uh, we will have uh, more conversations in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks so much, Adam. For uh, really appreciate Thanks, the opportunity. Bro. Thanks, Mohit. Right. Have a wonderful day. You too, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And one final note to everyone uh, who's watching, we will be sending out a recording. You'll receive an email uh, with the presentations, the contact information, um, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. And hope to see you all at uh, the Green Building Festival 2022 in November. Perfect.